Welcome to the online ministry of La Jolla United Methodist Church, a congregation of faithful Christians right along the Southern California coast. Together, we seek to grow in our individual spirituality and in connected community with one another. All are invited to join in this vibrant faith community. For more information, visit our website at LaJollaUnitedMethodist.org. May you be enriched in the hearing of these words, and may you receive and enjoy God's blessing. Please hear these words from 2 Samuel. When the wife of Uriah heard that her husband was dead, she made lamentation for him. When the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord, and the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, There were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb that he had bought. He brought it up, and it grew up with him and with his children. It used to eat of his meager fare and drink from his cup and lie in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was loath to take one of his flock or herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared that for the guest who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. He said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. He shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, you are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel and I rescued you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your bosom and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have added as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house, for you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, I will raise up trouble against you from within your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in broad daylight. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and in broad daylight. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I don't know if you saw it, but as I was sitting uh, in the, the chair, I call these the preacher bleachers. As I was sitting here, uh, and Rebecca came down off the, uh, uh, the chancel area here, she sort of shook her head and said, man, this was a hard scripture to read this morning. And this is two back to back, right? Because last week, we hear about what David did, how he harmed Bathsheba, and then how he arranged for the death of Uriah. That's what we read last week, and this week we're reminded of it, and we see that he gets called out on it. And so that's a hard thing to read. Thank you uh, for reading. I was in the grocery store a couple of days ago. I shop at the Vons in Pacific Beach. Um, I'm a creature of habit. We shopped at Vons when I was a kid, so of course I shop at Vons now. And uh, one of the things I like about this Vons, listen, one of my biggest pet peeves, biggest pet peeves, is when people don't put. It's not hard to put. So this this sermon's not about that. <laughs> but this this grocery store, they do a great job. Um, uh, having staff out there to collect all those carts and, and, and bring them in. Uh, but it's not just that. It's that um, they, they hire uh, young folks, and, and it seems as though, and I, I, I know I'm making some assumptions, but it seems as though they hire some folks who, who might have a, a difficult 
time working at other jobs. They're the kind of folks who, as they work, they have a one-on-one -on -one companion to help sort of guide them through what they need to do. So I imagine there is some level of special need. And this grocery store hires these persons, and then they have support persons uh, uh, to do good work, to bring in these carts, to bag groceries, things like that. I love uh, that this group does this. Uh, that this grocery store does this. M many of the, the people uh, who are in those roles are people, uh, uh, people of color, people who are m minority status. Now, that is background to tell you what happened uh, on Thursday when I was in the grocery store. Uh, I had just walked in. I had just gotten to the point where I was past the registers and I was turning down to get to the aisle uh, for the thing that I was there to get. And Someone who had come in behind me, she seemed to be in a bit of a rush because of how, she, uh, how fast she was walking. And just as she passed me, she, she uttered a short phrase. And it wasn't to me, but it was clearly words of exasperation. And it's a phrase I, I, I will not repeat. Not only is it not appropriate to say in church, but it's something I simply am not willing to say. Um, it started with an F-bomb, and then it got worse. Because after that, I-N-G was the N-word. I don't know what happened. I don't know what she experienced. I don't know if this had something to do with many of the people of color who work outside at that grocery store. I was flabbergasted. I, I was so shocked I was speechless, and that's a lot for me. I, I wish, I wish I hadn't been so shocked that I didn't say something. I wish that I had had the presence of mind in that moment to say, that's inappropriate. No matter what's going on, no matter the circumstance, that's not okay. It is deeply revolting. And if you hearing me just describe what this person said, if you felt that sense of shock, and I know that some of you did, I saw shaking heads, I saw looks of, of uh, frustration or, or concern on, on faces. If you had that same emotional response, then what you just illustrated is that there is power and weight to words. There is power and weight to words. And if you need more examples, well, we just talked about a few. When, when that person, and maybe it's a family member, and maybe it's a romantic partner, and maybe it's just a dear friend who says it in a slightly different way, but when somebody says to you, I love you, there's weight to that. It's beautiful. But there are other words. Maybe you... Uh, whether it comes to yourself or someone that you care about or even just an acquaintance, when you have heard the words, it's cancer, that carries weight. Words have power. Words have weight. Now, of course, we get to decide how we respond to those to the power of words. We get to respond uh, to how those things carry weight. But I don't believe that words are just meaningless. I know, I know the phrase, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. But I also know the phrase, the pen is mightier than the sword. I know the words and the impact they have. When a father says to a son, she's gone, son. There is weight. There's power in words. And words tell us a lot. I confess that when I heard this woman in the grocery store say those things, I feel, and I, I, clearly I made some assumptions, but I, I, it told me some things about her. And I know we've all known people who maybe they just say mean things or maybe they name call. Oh, they, they're just joking. He's really or she's really a good person, even though they say these things. Don't pay attention to what they say. They're a good person. Isn't it in the 15th chapter of the Gospel of Mark? 
That Jesus, when the Pharisees question him about whether or not his disciples should wash their hands in the ritualistic, appropriate way before they eat, doesn't Jesus say, it's not what goes into the mouth that defiles, it's what comes out of the mouth that defiles, because what comes out of the mouth comes from the heart. So don't come at me with, don't pay attention to what they say. I absolutely pay attention because that comes from the heart. It tells us something. Now, in the context of our worship services, the, tradition, uh, the traditional worship service places the sermon at the highest point of the worship service. And, and I say sort of the highest point, meaning the pinnacle, but actually, if you look at older church architecture, the sermon was often uh, taking place from a, a, an elevated position, not just a, a chancel but even then, the, the lectern or the pulpit would be elevated even more. And if you go back far enough in church history, you'll see that there are sometimes multi-level pulpits. You might, be, you might do the announcements from the low one. You might read from the, the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. You might read from the epistles from the middle one. But the gospel, you have to go all the way to the top. The preaching, you might go all the way to the top. And I have known uh, colleagues, ministerial colleagues, who have said, when I order a sense of worship, the sermon has to be the most important part. I don't know what's wrong with me. I don't think what I say is the most important part. <laughs> I, I don't. I think it is through the entirety of the worship service that we can experience God's guidance and God's word. And sometimes it's through incredible music and lyrics. And sometimes it's through a hymn. And sometimes it's through a prayer that someone who's not the preacher reads. And sometimes it's through the scripture. But I'm not willing to limit God and say God only speaks through the pastor. Because I just think God is bigger. I will also say that there are times, some of you I've said this before, there are times that I stand in the back of this church and it's after worship. And this is a time that I sometimes reflect on, on sort of how I did in worship. I'm always sort of self-evaluatory. And there are times that I stand back there and I think, oh man, I knocked that one out of the park. And that's when someone comes out and says, well, I mean, I like your shoes. <laughs> and there are times that I stand back there and I think, man, I could have done a lot better. I just I wasn't on it today. I didn't feel it. I, I should have prepared better. I should have done something different. Maybe I should have used different illustrations. And invariably, like every single time, someone will come back through those doors, sometimes in tears, and say, that is exactly what I needed to hear today which is one more sign that it's not me that's the most important thing that happens in church. God's Holy Spirit is present and active and speaking. In our text, David is called on the carpet for what he does. And how is it done? I mean, in one way, it's done through a sermon. Nathan, the prophet, a religious leader, he comes to him, and the first thing he does is he gives a sermon illustration. Here's a made-up story that has a point that connects with something in real life. And if that's not the job of a preacher to connect uh, our sacred text, to connect the will of God, to connect the ongoing words of God, with our life today, regardless of how long ago these were written, to connect these with life today, I suggest is the job of a preacher. Sometimes we do that through telling stories. Nathan comes to David and he tells a story where a person who has 
more money and more power and more privilege takes advantage of someone who has less of all of those things. I got a guest coming over. I don't want to use up any of my livestock, so I'm going to steal the one little ewe lamb that this family has grown attached to. And I'm going to kill it. And I'm going to feed it to my guest. And to his credit, David is appalled. This is completely inappropriate, and restitution must be made. And that's when Nathan makes what some preachers call the turn. It's you I'm talking about. It's you who have stolen and harmed. And also to his credit, David receives the weight of the word. He acknowledges that he has been so broken and so selfish to do this terrible, terrible, nearly unforgivable thing. He closes with those words uh, that were read at uh, verse 13. Here. Sorry, we, 11 and 12. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Now, there's a little more. You may see in your bulletin it says we end with 13a. That's just the first half of verse 13. Let me read all of 13 and a little bit more. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan said to David, now the Lord has put away your sin. You shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child that is born to you shall die. Then Nathan went to his house. David, in that moment, I believe, receives what we've talked about before receives God's prevenient grace, recognizes the harm he has done. And in doing so, David makes the choice to turn away from being away from God, from facing away from God, and turns back toward God. And what we might, United Methodists might call God's justifying grace. We've talked about it before where it's not just that we get a clean slate, but we get a whole new slate. David turns back to God. Now, if you know the rest of the story about David, you know that he he doesn't always stay facing God. He is imperfect, as I suggest all of us are. And he receives the weight of, of the word in that moment. He receives it. He makes a choice to recognize that he is in need of God's grace. He takes a moment in that time to say, I need to change. I need to do something different. And if that's not the work of God's Holy Spirit and an important aspect for we who gather in worship, whether we are online or in person, to receive the weight of God's word and let it impact us, change us, fill in our broken places so that we might turn back to God and respond. This is the power of the word. And I suggest again, friends, it's not just this time of worship, although this time of sermon, although I, I hope that it's helpful, I hope that it's positive, I hope that it connects ancient text with our lives today. And the weight of the word is carried in every hymn. The weight of the word is carried in every prayer. The weight of the prayer uh, of the word is carried in every musical moment. The weight of the word is carried when we celebrate baptism and Holy Communion. The weight of the word is projected on the screens and felt in the spirits of the people who gather in this place and through cameras and screens. The weight of the word is here and present and in us all. And like David, we can decide. Will I receive the weight of this word and will I let it change me and turn me to God?
God guide us. Amen.